went to engineering school for a whole of I attended class for one day. Thankfully, those days we had lagging, and so I was so badly lagged I never had courage to go back to engineering school the next day. When the decided that school was a Ramakrishna Ashram, I went there and then rest is history. So I got fired. The only second day I went to college was to cancel my admission. So and and I must also say NIT in that sense, uh, uh, those days we used to call colleges, regional engineering colleges during my generation. And so I had hoped to get into REC Suratkar because that is the year they introduced computer science. So I was like any other typical average Indian middle class end boy. Uh, I had 99.67 percent in my PCM, and I thought I would get into NIT Surat because there were no entrance exams those days. Unfortunately, there is only one seat for general merit, so the person with 100 percent marks took it, and that is how I took some college in Bangalore and then got dragged. And luckily, all that happened to my life. I say lucky because otherwise I wouldn't have possibly. Come across this extraordinary life and message of Swami Vivekananda. I think every young man in this country should understand and read. Not because you should give up anything and serve, but at least give yourself some meaning to live. And that is why I would say it comes in part of our lives. But then coming fast forward into 2022, I'm at least glad that all of you are on campus. Uh, more importantly, uh, uh, two years has been a very difficult time for not just India, for the world. It's been a time of great discovery and in my opinion possibly provided us with a lot of space to think. It also gave us the time to understand that we were all eternally busy doing nothing and suddenly two years you are recognizing you are actually doing nothing, calling yourself busy and suddenly you are also now wondering how did you, how, how did you even spend those two years, you know, whether it's at home, whether it's in front of a computer, attending classes. And teaching even today at Cornell, I know that you know when students come online, you could just switch off the video and go have a cup of coffee or go to sleep, and you wouldn't even get to know. I'm not sure how it is in your colleges, but in the US, we can enforce the video should be on. So you know that's how the, the that's how the rules of the game are. And so it's 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 been a fascinating time. But amidst all this time, the challenge that we face, the public uh, situation that we were in, millions of lives lost around the world. I think it was a great reset button for all of us. Uh, and I say this with conviction because it showed the enormity of human advancement. It also showed the enormous capability of human beings to create problems for ourselves. You know, we are, I think your generation uh, was possibly the, the greatest wake up call was the last two years. I say this uh, mainly because I personally believe my generation let all of you down. Because we have screwed up enough and now we want you to clean up the mess. Because we have brought the situation to such a, situ uh, such a state that we have created and handing over the legacy of not leadership, of not joy, of not peace, but the legacy of three major kinds of problems that we are all embedding you with. And what you see playing out today, whether it's COVID or whether it's anything else, is all consequences of those problems we are giving you. The first challenge that I think that we have created for you is a, a, a ecological crisis of enormous proportions. You know, in our own mad pursuit of consumeristic living uh, with no end, despite a person like Gandhi saying we have everything for our need but not for our greed, today we consume resources which are possibly every year if you were to calculate on a measurable scale, in six months we, com we consume a year-long supply of natural resources. Which means, if passing time, we are going to destroy the earth to such an extent that there will be no recovery at all. You can even see the kind of temperatures that Delhi, where I am living now, is going through. It is unheard of. The hottest month in many, many, many decades in March is this year. And I am sure Amitpur will be no different. The point, of, the reason I am saying this is we have adopted lifestyles, which necessarily is always at the cost of something. It's not just the cost of natural resources. I'll explain the other two problems also. It's the cost of something else. And then the current economic models that we have created, which you're all going to be part of or entering that system, we have created another box of problems uh, of, of enormous socioeconomic inequities. You know, the differences between haves and the have-nots and the stark difference that COVID brought out. Two people in the world just between... Uh, 
Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos well can celebrate their entrepreneurship, the kind of wealth that they created for themselves within nine months was unprecedented in the kind of wealth anybody created during the COVID time. When millions lost their jobs, when billions were starving, we had an economic model where a few people were benefiting out of this crisis. And whatever it is, you know, the reality is I'm not, I'm not criticizing that they should not be making money or they should give it all away. That's not my intent. I'm only talking about what are we creating for ourselves? We are created an enormous inequity situation where if you just look at COVID itself or if I were to give the construct of the world and not just India, India is slightly better because our, our government did an enormously positive job in trying to make sure we mitigate some of the problems. But around the world, if I were to give you this example, the amount of money that the top 10% of the world made during this crisis was 10 times what they could have made if there were no crisis. And the amount of money that the poor of the world, the bottom 10% or the bottom most 1% lost, it will take them 10 years more to reach back pre-COVID levels. You can, you can understand the inequity that we have created, the model of inequity that we have created, and we need to worry about it. Your generation needs to really be concerned about it because you are the privileged class. Uh, the kids in our uh, NITs and IITs and IAMs, I believe, are the privileged class in this country, and you have an obligation to set right, continue to press the reset button, and therefore we can really look at is there an alternate model which can address this crisis. And the third crisis, which is of great concern to me, especially because I work with a lot of many people around the world. Every year I talk or engage or interact with close to 200,000 young people. I mentor several hundreds of them. And my concern is, suddenly I find the youth of today are rudderless. You acquire qualifications, but you don't acquire a purpose in life. You acquire degrees, but sometimes you only think that you ought to get a job with them. So I find the tragedy of a situation in our country or a world even where the highest number of suicides is in people less than 25 years of age. And COVID, what it exposed was the enormity of mental health challenges that all of you went through. Because you suddenly had nothing to do, at least you were going to college earlier. You were at least you were pretending to study or sitting in fr amongst friends and having coffee in your uh, messes or wherever. And suddenly when that was removed, Life was rudderless again. So the deep inner convictions of why you are born, why do you exist, what can you do with your life was missing. And to me, that crisis is something which I feel uh, the youth of India can actually stand up and tell the world, you know what, guys, this is the way we need to live. And what is it that we can do? And what do I see? Where do I see all of you growing and going into? I think all our educational institutions, our brick and mortar universities can only take you that far. Today, education itself is getting redefined. Now, I'm, I'm part of several committees, part of the NEP. I uh, try to get the government's capacity building process going on. There's so much that we are doing, but what I'm recognizing increase, qualifications are becoming increasingly irrelevant. So if you think that a degree at NIT or IIT is going to change your life, I think it's time to think again. It might possibly give you some skill sets it might give you some knowledge to begin a, a, a way of living, but it is not going to calibrate your life. And that's something. And so you must use the opportunity of education, not to focus on the kind of courses you do or the degrees you gain, but to ask yourself, am I preparing myself to lead my life the way I want to lead? And so what are the skill sets that we as young people need to have to negotiate the world that we are living in today? And I want to just mention three or four, and I hope that our universities will possibly end up giving you those abilities. Today, we are in a situation where I think only classroom learning can give us that space. And so I would like you to see how you can acquire, and, and you also live in a, you're a privileged class, privileged generation, where you can access information from anywhere in the world at any time on any instrument at your convenience. I don't think anybody else has this privilege. You know, I. I, 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 I'm actually jealous of your generation, the kind of abilities and opportunities you have. And I'm trying to get some benefit. I try to do at least five to six massive online courses every year. And I find it fascinating that you can get the best of knowledge from around the world at no cost even, sometimes at very minimal cost. 
And so you don't really need to worry about whether you're an ordinary engineering college, you're a tier two college, or a top one college. Maybe your campus interviews might be better at NITs. But beyond that, like I said, if it is fashioning life in the university called life itself, I think you need some skill set. So what do you need? What, what is it that is going to be really precious? Are people who are going to be able to participate in co-generating solutions for the crisis that we are leaving you behind with? Whether it is crises of the planet, or crisis of society and the socio-economic inequities we have created for you, or the crisis of your own self. So if you can learn how to build yourself and give yourself the ability to negotiate these two crises, I think you will be the most valued commodity. And you will be a person who will be wanted for companies. If I were to come recruiting, I would look for those kind of people and not for qualifications. I look for qualities, abilities, and skill sets, and the mindset that you perform those skills. So what do we need? The three or four things I want to lay out there and then I'll, I'd like to open it up to interact with all of you because I think I can learn a lot from such wonderful people in this audience today. Cumulatively, all your age put together far exceeds my experience and therefore it's an opportunity for me to learn what you people can tell me also. So what is it that you, what is going to be very, very important for you? So I believe that what you need today is to learn to be a disruptor. Not a conformist. We are training you in our universities to conform. And I want to challenge you and say disruption is not destruction. There's a difference. Now, I've always been a non-conformist all my life and I've done, done pretty well in my life too. So I think conforming is not going to give you the ability to solve tomorrow's problems today. It's not even going to give you the ability to solve today's problems today. It can possibly give you knowledge to solve yesterday's problems. But yesterday's problems are not there. All of us as faculty or as teachers or mentors or guides have experiences of yesterday's problems. We don't even know what tomorrow's problems are going to be. But you, with your abilities and bandwidth, or if you at all you have to learn anything, you have to only learn how to learn. And you have to more importantly learn how to learn by yourself, with yourself, and along with your colleagues. So what is it that you should learn? The first thing is how to be a disruptive innovator. Innovation is not imitation. Now we live in a world of imitation. You, you have Twitter, we want to imitate and create a coup. Now I think we have to move beyond it. Why can't India be the innovation hub of the world where the best of minds are there in India? You have the enormous advantage of building on the enormity of the language ability of English, mathematical DNA that Indians somehow have been having in their genes and all these abilities and why do you want to be a chief imitator? Why don't you think out of the box, have the courage, take the risk, be an entrepreneur and your generation can afford to do that because let's say my, my, my own grandfather's generation, he was a simple ordinary temple priest or a village priest. He had five, five children and he and his wife and that means seven people, he would earn 25 paise, 30 paise a day and with that six people, but seven people including himself were dependent on what little he earned. Fast forwarding to my father's generation, he was in a government employment. My mother was a homemaker. We were three children and just five people depending on my father's salary. Today, I have one son and my wife is a gynecologist, two of us. My son doesn't depend on me, he never depended on us. Today, that means we are all, my son has an extraordinary opportunity of not even depending on us which means I also don't depend on him. There's no question of my waiting for him to earn his living to take care of me. You're all in that generation of my son. And I believe the dependency ratios being what it is in our country, if your generation doesn't take the risk and the adventure spirit of what entrepreneurship is all about, India will lose the battle in being an innovation hub. So I think it's time for institutions like yours not to give you degrees alone, but to give you courage to learn what to do with those degrees. And that is where being a disruptive innovator, moving away from the norm, breaking conformity and conforming situations, and exploring what is it that you can create to solve the two, three crises I mentioned about, that is going to be the future. The second, whether we like it or not, criticize as much as we can, or your parents may complain or your teachers may say, I think emerging technology is the way the world is going to go. And we may see emerging technology in a very superficial cosmetic way of Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and all this nonsense. But those are just simple tools that are products of technology. 
But I think the world needs technology and the way technology can be addressed to solve this crisis that I mentioned. And so if you can think of situations where you become socially responsible, technologically savvy, and the spirit of disruption that you can deploy and keep one mantra as the way forward for all your lives, I think what is practical and pragmatic for your generation is to explore opportunities that give you private gains. It's unfair to ask your generation of young people to say, go and serve Mother India. I think it's all nonsense. None of you are going to be able to do it. On the other hand, what I would say is find ways to be generate opportunities for private gains while also trying to enable public good. So every one of us must look for how do we create private gains for ourselves. It's not wrong. And that's exactly what the world needs. But by ensuring private gains for yourself, can you end up enabling public good around your world? And I think if you can figure this out and if you can get this ability, the third quality you need for that is that visionary leadership that every one of you should give yourself. For too long, the youth of today have looked up to others to be role models. I think the world needs young people to be role models for the rest of us. And this is where what we need is conviction in your own capabilities, belief in your inner potential, and the confidence that you can be the change makers that we are desperately looking for as a nation, as a world. So I'm going to say what we need are the belief that you can be the change maker. You have the belief that you, with the skill set that you are gaining, with the technological advancement you're doing, you can be the person who can change the history of this country. Remember, India is rapidly urbanizing. So what we need is not more and more urban problems, but urban solutions to rural India. And so whether it is President, President Kalam's way of thinking of providing urban amenities, I wouldn't even call them urban amenities. That's got a very negative connotation to me at least. What I would call are potentially powerful opportunities to change India's rural landscape with these kind of ideas. And can, can, we, can you actually bring prosperity and plenty to rural India? Can you make rural economies the hub of Indian growth story? If you're talking about $5 trillion economy that the Prime Minister has given a call for all Indians, I think can that battle start from rural India? Not seeing rural Indians as consumers of products made in urban India, but creators of products in urban India can can we actually bring about a revolution by ensuring that they get the best of education, health, transportation, energy security, and all these things that we all need as mankind in the construct of rural India, where rural India becomes more urbanized in terms of facilities and not just in terms of losing its cultural values that we are all famous for. That is a new model of economic growth that we need to create. We need to create a situation where people like you who want to go to rural India, not because they're inspired, but because you know, that is a way for the world to grow itself. And if that conviction can be set in right, a new economic model where a compassionate, soulful economy, which creates, like I said, private gains along with public good, that can be done. I think we would be on the pathway of growth and success. So what we need from young people like you is to ask yourself, can I learn to operate from zones of incompetence? We are making you competent electronic engineers, but are incompetent in everything else. So can you ask yourself, how do I now not only acquire competence in whatever I've been trained in, but have the humility to keep expanding my bandwidth by agreeing that I'm incompetent in so many other things and acquire those competences, keep that urge to be a lifelong learner, be a lifelong adventurer, be a lifelong risk taker, and jump into this battle to solve the crisis that we are creating. That self is built on those lines and you solve the problem of the self. I think you will also solve the problem of society. You also solve the problem of this, what I spoke about, the planet and the crisis that we are leaving you behind. Otherwise, there is no future for this country. If your generation fails India, fails the world, I think then we are doomed not to have a world at all. So it's an obligation. It is an absolute necessity for all of you to Put your heads together, co-generate solutions. And the last point I want to leave you with is if one once upon a time we celebrated heroes, we celebrated individuals, I think no longer is that going to be a way forward. 
what we need to celebrate our social collectives we need to celebrate all of you together and not each of you as a person today the world's problems cannot be solved by one man or one woman alone what we need is powerful ideas coming from people disparately located or around the country around the world coming together bound together with a common purpose what should bind you together is a common purpose to solve these problems and in that commonness to giving you the ability to co-generate solutions so if you haven't learned teamwork if you haven't learned collaborative skills i think you will not be a wanted product in the job market even today but the way things are emerging and developing you are not going to be employed for just how good you are or whether you scored a great rank or got a 9.9 on a 10 gpa you are going to be rank graded and celebrated by what i said being a lifelong learner having the humility to do that being collaborative learning to work with others being a disruptor being innovative learning how to manage emerging technologies and living in a world very comfortably where data is something which you can use as a source as a resource as an ability as a powerful tool and if you do that i think that is where you will surely be a success and success the way i see it is not setting another amazon or another google or another apple or another cisco but success to me is in the process of setting it up also solving the world's problems so finding private gains along with ensuring public good is what will make you special and unique and that is the team india that we all need to have that is the new india that vivekananda spoke about in dreamt and he said my faith is in the younger generation and to conclude he said give me a handful of young men and women and i will change the world he said and i think that handful of young men and women are you today and hopefully i will be still alive to see you change the world so i'm going to stop here pause here and open up for any questions that i could possibly share and interact with and then we'll see how it goes so thank you all so much again for this extraordinary opportunity to be with around 100 of you such young people and hopefully you will be somebody that all of us will remember thank you thank you sir for your insightful remarks uh from here on out we are looking forward to learning more about you and getting answers to some of our questions if anyone wants to ask a question please turn your video on and raise your hands we will let you speak to dr bala right now the youth the future engineers of india are listening to you and who else can guide them better than you to innovate for rural india so how can we being engineers contribute and invent for rural india i think you got to first first thing you got to do stop thinking of yourself as engineers i think that is the, that is a big mistake because then you're boxing yourself into finding solutions from an engineering perspective you got to think yourself as decent human beings first you got to see yourself as possibility of, of just people who are compassionate and want to make a difference you got to see yourself as purposeful human beings wanting to make a difference in the enormously powerful beautiful country of ours that's all the ability you need and in vivekananda's language is that all you need a three h he said the first h he said is the heart to feel it's not an engineering degree or a medical degree just the heart to feel he said feel my children feel feel for the poor the ignorant the downtrodden feel till you think that your heart will stop and your mind reels and then will come enormous power for you to do good he said i think that's the kind of feeling we need feel for rural india with that intensity and the second thing that just feeling is not enough he said the head to think then you start asking yourself what are the problems don't go with the idea that you have solutions for rural india india is managed without all of us india will continue to manage without all of us see it see rural india as an opportunity for you to serve not as a opportunity to solve problems for i think there's a big difference in this the moment you have the arrogance to think that as engineers we can go solve india's problems you've lost the game have the humility to say i am going to go co create solutions i'm going to work with people you can't work for rural india you have to learn to work with rural indians that's a big difference so i would say as engineers throw away this idea identity of an engineer acquire the identity of a compassionate to a humble human being who wants to feel for this india 
which is which is there out there and then say what is the solution i can strategize for a problem that is coming up and emerging which is getting articulated by these people and finally the hands to work the third hedge so hard to feel the head to think and the hands to work you got to go do the problem solving yourself with me so i think motivation strategy and action are two critical components of leadership and vivekananda in his own way says hard to feel head to think and hands to work so all you got to do is just go you will find problems or problems will find you people will find you you will think through solutions and you will experiment you will never have a perfect solution if you think you are going to prescribe a solution for rural india rural india is sensible enough to adjust you also quite fast uh, so so i have another question for you uh, so we talked about how consumerism is at at its peak it's like Uh, people want to consume more and more. The society, the way it's constructed, wants people to consume more and more. So, how can we try to tackle the problem of consumerism, which is there in people's mind? It's not a technological problem. It's just people. It, it's their own mindset. How can we solve that problem? I think why we got to solve this problem on a very personal level, right? I don't think we can tell the world how to live. We have been trying that model; it is not working. It will never work. If I were to ask you a personal question, how many pair of jeans you have? Uh, four or five. Four or five. Do you know it takes eight thousand liters of water to make one pair of jeans? And then we say, "Oh, what save the world? Save the earth? We don't need four jeans, right?" So the greatest carbon footprint in the world is manufacturing clothes. and only we need only three pairs of clothes every year new ones but we get about eight, seven to 10 at least right and we buy them even we know how many times have you change a refill on your pen i grew up on a generation where we use fountain ink or we change refills you would not change pens today if pen is over you throw it in get another pen so simple things like that it's not extraordinary they're very simple things how many of us or uh, any people uh, does not just some just be man all of us i think many of them people use all these with different fair fair creams and vanishing creams and all all of them have microplastic beads in them can you make conscious choices and say i will not buy a product which is got a microplastic bead in it i will not contribute and you can only do it at the individual level and it's not saying that it will change the whole world let me begin with myself and like gandhi says we got to be the change we want to see So can I stop buying the extra clock when I don't want it? Can I stop not changing my phone every time my phone brings out a new model? Why do you have to buy it, right? Why not be satisfied with the same old phone which is working perfectly well? Why do you want the latest upgrade for everything? I can understand software upgrade, but every time something comes out, why are we constantly searching for that? So I think it's a personal choice, and the only way we can make a difference is in. the choices we can make a difference instead of telling the world how to live i tell myself how i will live in that and i think that's the best idea for me that's the way i think that's the only way you can have, i'm not a consumerism by itself is not bad consumerism when you don't need the consumer product and you still acquire it that is what is causing the problem so i try to incorporate that in my own life Uh, so we learned about the internship options provided by Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement, and this internship opportunity is unlike any other that we students do to put on our put on our resumes. This is more about creating a positive change in the society. So, what advice would you give to young people who have come become engaged in pursuit of corporate cooperative internships? How might the SVYM internships help them to grow as individuals? What we do is all we do is. enable a platform provide you a platform to come and express yourself we have eight people coming from around the country many of them from iits and iits and it, like i said it's not the institution you come from it's the intent with which you come several of them do come for a cv value right because i know a lot of eight people they intern with me or if they work directly under me they get admissions in several institutions abroad and i don't say it's wrong that's private gain but in acquiring that if they can do public good i am okay with So I tell them, um, like I said, I only ask these questions: How serious are you about doing what you're doing? 
what what are the skill sets you bring to the table and how comfortable you are in saying that i don't know answers i don't have the answers because sometimes what has happened is all of us belong to, all of you rather belong to a generation where we celebrate marks we celebrate achievement we celebrate first class and cgp at 10 that we don't celebrate not knowing we're celebrating knowing so much that you start believing you know everything and you don't so I tell people, if you want to come and work with me, have the humility to say, I don't know. Otherwise, you become, right? And, and then we ask, we expose you to different oral challenges, right? From economic models, food processing units that we run, uh, drinking water, sanitation, healthcare, technology-enabled solutions. We have, we run our organization on SAP, and many youngsters haven't even seen how to use SAP today. So we, we, we say that you can actually be the best. Just because you're serving rural India doesn't mean that you've got to be mediocre. You can challenge yourself. I have the best of being people manning very important positions. And we say this is how you get exposed to it and see can you be part of the solution frame. And 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 many of them spend a the month, spend two months, some of them come back and spend six months, some of them actually come back, graduated, don't go back. I have had young IITs come and stay back and they stayed on. And it's not all out there, call it 10 or 12 years, and we still have people continue to work. So I think the excitement of Discovering your true potential is what happens during an internship. We don't really need any people to come and work for us. That is stupid. You will say somebody can work for you. But we only create a platform where any people can come and discover themselves. And through the discovery, are socially useful also. That is what an internship is. So, sir, uh, this term that we have to work we can't work for anyone like we have to work with them like it i think it's inspired with swami vivekananda's work when he said that you can't help someone like you can only serve them so like what's the logic behind it like see uh, vivekananda says it so beautifully and i i always keep telling myself he must have written it for me that's the way i see it he says don't stand on a pedestal and say, here, my poor man, take my five cents. Consider yourself privileged that there's an opportunity for you to actually participate in this giving process. Because it's in giving that you're truly blessed. He then says, all the hospitals you build, all the schools you construct can get washed away in one cyclone or can, can crumble to dust in one earthquake. The cow which gave birth to the calf knows how to give it milk. So God knows how to take care of the people he created. But he's giving an extraordinary opportunity to do something for it. And so he says, if you're thinking of I'm helping somebody, then it is arrogant posturing and only enables your ego. On the other hand, if you say it's a privilege that I have the opportunity to celebrate the divinity in the other, Shiva Jnana Jeeva Seva, he says, if we can celebrate the divinity in the other, that is my pursuit of life. So India, Seva is such an Indian civilizational construct where we don't serve just, we don't, it's not transaction for us. Help is transactional. I help you and you say thank you. That's a very Western construct. Seva is non transactional, beneficial to both. So in giving, I'm actually taking. And if you do it with the humility of seeing the divinity in the other, that is the beauty of Seva. And that is what Vivekananda. And that's where I say the public good. Right? And the private gain is your growth. So finally, all this, at some point of time in your life, you realize all this is for what? It is for that self-discovery that we are all existing. And we do it through different means, and seva is one opportunity and one means. Yes. Sir, you once said that people become carried away with greatness while doing service work, and aham grows instead of service. So how can one avoid this predicament and stay focused on the actual goal? It's very difficult. It's very, very difficult. I have fallen and been tempted by pride and visibility. I've had a former chief minister of Karnataka write my biography. And after some time, you start thinking, I must be great. And then you fall and then you wake up. So what I would advise all of you is all, only way to be conscious about it is extreme mindfulness. Constant self-awareness and mindfulness is the only way to watch yourself from falling. This other way. And only when, um, at least in my case, I can only speak from my experience, having fallen and got up again, 
I think it is not worth following at all. And so mindfulness is what I mean. There's no other. I think somebody else raised their hand and says, Sakshi. I think you guys can see it. I may not be able to see it. Nikita, can you see? So I saw this message came. So. Manik, so we'll, Manik has raised his hand and then there's a queue for hands. I don't know whether you can open the queue. Can I open the queue? Here? I guess, yes. I can yes, see sir. Manik has yes, sir. Uh, Nikita, can you unmute? When yeah, Manik has raised his hand. If you want to go, Manik, I don't know how to unmute you. Please go ahead, Manik. Manik, I think you can speak to ask your question right now, sir. Yes, I can't hear you. If you can type it out also, I can answer. So wait, let us. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess so. Uh, he he accidentally did that. That's fine. Let me. Yes, so moving forward, whatever you said, that was just truly inspiring. And I must say that our audience would grab the most out of it. So thank you so much. Uh, there are no questions. Any, any other questions, I'll be happy to answer for a few more minutes. Otherwise, such a pleasure being with all of you today. Uh, sir, I have another question for you. Sir, you have wealth of experience in variety of fields, including social work, founding numerous movements, and contributing to the development work. And we all know how prone India is to corruption. How you closely uh, have you closely observed the country's corruption? How were you affected by it? And what you did to overcome or try to overcome the situation during your many years many years of experience? I think it's it's a very long answer, but I'm going to just be as short as I can. I think India's greatest challenge is corruption. And corruption does not happen in isolation. Every one of us have become corrupt in some ways. If I were to challenge all of you, how many of you wear helmets? You know, when the police is there, you take the helmet off your handlebar and wear it. How many of your parents have built houses following perfect rules? You know, the government said leave five feet in the front, three feet in the side, six feet in the back, or something like that. And we don't. We think land is so expensive, we don't. So in our own ways, all of us have learned to be driven by honesty of convenience. So this country can change. We can only talk of solving corruption, not by fighting corruption. I've been an anti-corruption activist. I was part of Team Anna. I have been part of the Loka Ekta in Karnataka for five years. I was a Santosh Ekdes, as vigilance director. I have fought corruption all my life. In my book, I the Citizen, I write about the entire anti-corruption movement that has involved in with Anna, Zari and others. In, I write, I've co-written a book called Fighting Corruption. And after all this, I believe you cannot fight corruption. Each of us can only stay, fight to stay honest. And if every one of us decides to stay, just stay honest, that's all we can do. And like I said, in the environmental space, even in the moral space, if we say, I will not lead to corruption, it's very, very uncomfortable being honest nowadays. It's very convenient being dishonest. But if you value honesty much more than you value convenience, then I think you'll stay honest the rest of your life. It's painful, it's frustrating. I have been. I have suffered the consequences of it. I have been beaten up, I have been arrested. But I have never left. The great joy I have is I have never compromised. So if you are ready to value values higher than the convenience of being dishonest, I think that's all you need to fight corruption. Sir, I have another question related regarding this. Like for example, let's say there is an arbitrary rule set up by the government. And maybe that rule is the is causing distrust or uh, is causing pain to a lot of people, and uh, we have to bypass that rule in order to serve others. So how do we make that call? You know, if, if, if it is not if the rule is wrongly made, breaking it is a moral obligation. But if the rule is made with a larger interest. If you're not, it can't be given. But like I said, it's not convenience that's making you break it. By conviction, I have broken rules, and like I said, I have, I have sued the country, I have sued the state, I have sued governments because I believe the rule was wrong. So fight that rule making itself. Like I said, it's going. It's a hard battle. There's no shortcut for this. 
But then that's a that's a job, right? You cannot expect your generation's control I delete. You think if you press that everything will get deleted? It doesn't work that way. So three things Vivekananda says: he thought that you cannot do social work. He says three P's: purity, patience, and perseverance. All three you need. You will have to be absolutely pure in your thought, word, and deed, so nobody can criticize you. You must be patient. These things don't change overnight. It takes time to change. What you've inherited over generations cannot just disappear overnight. And you can't give up. It's frustrating. You feel like giving up. I have felt like giving up so many times. That's the truth. But then you persevere and say, I will not give up. Society will finally yield. And you win the battle. But you have to fight long enough. These are not easy things. It may seem like great advice. But when you start doing it, it's not a bed of roses. There will be a lot of thorns. But you'll have to learn to wear iron slippers, a thorn becomes crushed and not pricking your toes. So that is the only way to fight this battle. And it's not easy. So my suggestion to all of you is you can't learn to be an expert swimmer before you jump into the swimming pool. Prepare yourself with a little basic knowledge of swimming, enough so that you don't drown. And as you keep swimming, you become better and better in this ocean called social. Sir, so you once spoke about the global citizen notion and the connectivity of people, societies, and environments all around the world, emphasizing the importance of contributing the uh, to the better global community. How can we improve society by being global citizens? I think uh, you know. Again, everything I say or speak about is all inspired by Vivekananda's thinking. Vivekananda says it so beautifully. He says, first focus on yourself. Be selfish. It's very funny. Vivekananda asks us, he said, selfishness is a sin. But the way I understand Vivekananda is begin with yourself. Get yourself to be the best in every possible way. Take care of your heart, body, mind and soul. And once you're ready for that, with that then look around you, expand yourself. Life is expansion, he says. Look at your immediate family members and say, how do I make their lives better? In the Indian construct, our parents, our siblings, etc. And then expand it to your extended families. Then you say, my street, my village. And unfortunately, in our country, we say, my caste today. I think we should not get narrowed down like that and say, my street, my village, my taluk, my district, my state, my nation. And Vivekananda says, my universe. Because today, we are so interconnected. If there is a viral outbreak in Wuhan, we also suffer. So we have to understand the geographical boundaries are a limitation for the world's progress. But we need an identity. And if either Indi the Indian identity is the best that we can have, because it is India which civilizationally talks of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, where we are inspired by our forefathers to say the whole world is our family, entire creation is our family. So it's already part of a civilizational ethos. So having an Indian identity enables your thinking to be a global citizen very comfortably. So I believe if you can transcend narrow boundaries, it doesn't matter to me whether some of you are going to live in the United States, some of you are going to live in Africa, Timbuktu, or some of you might be. Where you live is irrelevant. But if you start looking at the entire world as a family, the growth that I described, the outward expression of expansion and absorbing everybody into your fold, I think that is the best way to express global citizenship, where we believe the entire world is my responsibility. If a child in Tanzania is hungry and suffering, if there is a, if there is a genocide in Sudan or any other country, your heart should bleed. And you should not just see it as a newspaper headline in some corner doesn't have a thing, you not have a thing. Every, that, is, that is the time when you can know that you have really become a global citizen. Today it is just news. Tomorrow it will be troubling news for which you want to co-create a solution. And when you reach that stage, that is when you know you are right as a global citizen. Till then, you're only selfishly growing in that chain of progress that I said. And it's okay, but keep expanding it. If, you're, if your relative dies, you feel sad. That means you've reached that circle. Tomorrow, if somebody you know in your village is uh, affected by some illness, you feel bad and you want to do something for it. It means your circle is expanded. Tomorrow, if India bleeds, you feel bad for it. We only feel bad when India loses a cricket match today. But when now, when you keep expanding your feeling for the entire society and for civilization and for the whole world as such, then you know that you have a real global citizen. So it's not the passport you carry, but it's the expansiveness of your heart that determines it.
Uh, so I have like one more question that you are a professor. I wanted two of you are engaging you in questions. But, <laughs> so yeah. there are too many people like it's difficult to get chaotic, sir. Yeah. So like, you are you are a professor at Cornell University. You know Western education system as well as Indian education system. So what are the difference? What are the larger difference that you see between both education systems? And the students and how they approach their studies or their life or in general. You know, I think um, we had a great education system in the past. Unfortunately, whether you call it microization of Indian education, we haven't reversed it till the NEP is coming now. And the NEP's benefit, you people may not get it. But maybe the next generation will have the benefit of NEP. I believe India's greatest strength was one of the few civilizations in the world which understood and deconstructed education correctly. We created a generation of people in our gurukulas who understood repetitive learning and the benefit of repetitive learning and the growth of the human being along with reflective learning. We had mastered the combination of repetition with reflection. People would repeat the slokas or the mantras and then go back and deconstruct and reflect on it and say how does it affect life and human progress. But today then we came down to a situation where we were just wanted to be made cheap imitations of the West to become clerks in the missionary that controlled us. And we simply continued the system till the NEP came in. In the West, especially the US, which I'm where I continue to teach at Cornell, so I, I, I'm exposed to young people who are brought up reflecting a lot. You know, they're constantly challenging and thinking and asking themselves, why is it like this? So the ability to uh, pursue self-inquiry and inquiry of what's happening around them is encouraged there. Whereas here, we got a compliance and conformity is encouraged. If you write an answer which I expect, then I give you the marks. If you think that you want to be creative, then I say you are Adhika Prasanthi. What is this? You are acting very big. You know, we don't celebrate uh, non-conformity and I'm in a constructive way. I'm not saying non-conformity in a destructive way, but you know, we, we want the young people to write exactly the answer I teach you. Right, and that's when you get high marks, and we have mastered it. So we only we have de deconstructed. But the West is, I think, encourages people to think of their own, to do things on their own. There's a lot of project work, very application driven. It's about life. So if you graduate from a Western university, you will immediately use what you have learned. If you graduate from an Indian university today, you have a very strong theoretical foundation, and you discover how to apply it in your job. It takes some time for you to do that. So my belief is. If NEP can be rolled out in the veteran spirit in which it has been crafted, it's a wonderful set of people who put it together. And we are actually able to bring it in place in the, within the next 10 years as it's been conceived by 2030. I think we'll be a very strong, powerful knowledge center of the world itself. But it takes time. We only need the proper teachers to actually do that. We don't have that generation of people. So more and more young people like you actually acquire knowledge from around the world. That's not a very good thing. I went to Harvard. I'm still happy doing, I think I, I go there to teach to say that if I bring Indianness to the teaching there, right, at corner a lot of places. So I believe that each of us are extremely powerful and capable and acquire it, doesn't matter where you get the knowledge from, which part of the world you get it from, come back and frame it in the context of the NEP and give yourself, uh, give this nation of what you acquired yourself and I think that way we'll be able to change the system. So it is different. I wouldn't say which is better. It's unfair to say something is better or something is worse because most of our Indians are product of the Indian education system are thrived in the West after understanding how to use it. Nobel Tadelas of the world, the Indra movies and all the Sundar Pichais are all Indian educated, right? And so they had the foundation here and they, the West taught them how to apply the foundational knowledge. So we need Indians to also have that opportunity within India to start applying the foundational knowledge. And we can create craft what can be possible is brilliant for them. So I see it that way. And end people are end people. Everybody is restless, wanting to solve the world's problems, whether it's young Indian or young American. Today's I, I am I'm very positive. I think we live in a generation where people actually have understood that they can't be part of the problem. They have to be part of the solution. And that is why there is hope for the world. So you once claimed that if uh, we follow Swami Vivekananda's message of compassion for the poor and needy, India's problems will vanish overnight. 
and that it is India's youth who can change the country for the better. Could you please just explain how the how we may embody Swamiji's teachings and find solutions for the, for our country's significant problems? So two two extraordinary qualities you can draw from Swamiji's message is he was an intellectual giant. He had gigantic intellectualism with possibly an overwhelming power of compassion. I think this combination is what we need to acquire. I, I see young people today, either they're intellectually brilliant, but very miserly in their expression for outward society, with their expression of compassion. Other kind of young people I see is they are not compassionate to themselves even. They're so demanding of themselves, they forgot how to be compassionate to themselves. So I say, even if you don't call it Vivekananda, you can just say, how do I combine this intellectual brilliance of mine that, that is very inside. You know, that's the inside expression of my ability. With the outside expression of this brilliance manifesting as compassionate, do good, doing good for society. That's all the message we need to take. And you'll find, I always think that every, there's no one single answer for every person in this country. Each of you might discover how that manifestation will play out. For somebody, it could be teaching, somebody it could be setting up a company and having a thousand people to work for, somebody it can be. A different model itself, right? But if you can, if it should be driven by that, that what I call the private gains of public good. The private gains is your internal growth, not just financial growth, right? It's financial is part of it, but there's much deeper to it. The outer expression is public good. Is public good? I think that is the India that Vivekananda said and people can build. He had a beautiful way of describing it. He said a new India will arise, not by pulling down the rich, but by pushing up the poor. He said a new India will arise, not by a revolution. It is not by the drum, right? He said, but by the evolution. And the evolution that youth of today can have is a brilliant ability to combine the intellectualism with compassion, societal compassion. And if you can evolve into that person, that is the change India needs, and that is what will actually help India to change. So I think that is a cohort of young Indians that Vivekananda dreamt of. He said, give me a handful of young men and women. This is the kind of young men and women you want. He said, you know, he wants lion-hearted young men and women. And this is what lion-heartedness needs. And if that happens, I think we are there. Uh, so that was really, really insightful. Uh, so time is like time oh. is never sufficient when you got the opportunity to listen to such in insightful talk and get guidance in life. Thank you, now that the session has come to an end, it gives us immense pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks for this event. We on behalf of Team Webhav together extend a very hearty vote of thanks to Dr. R. Pala Subramanyam for your supporting nature throughout the entire session and also for gracing this event and sharing with us your findings and opinions today. Sir, thank you so much for responding to the inquisitive minds. Uh, your words have encouraged us all and brightened our spirits. Really, thank you so much. Thank you and all the best to all of you. Hopefully your path will cross and will make us all proud. <laughs>